Today we are making our SDS gel and we have a recipe to make a 10% gel. And that recipe is seven mils of solution A. So I'm gonna add seven mils of solution A to an Erlenmeyer. And our Erlenmeyer already has 8.5 mils of water in it, because that's how much we're going to need. So seven mils of solution A. Now remember, you are working with acrylamide, and acrylamide is a neurotoxin. And because acrylamide is a neurotoxin, anytime you touch anything related to acrylamide, you must have gloves on your hands. Um, acrylamide is absorbed through the skin, so we don't want any of you to suffer neurological damage long, from long-term exposure to acrylamide, so please make sure that you are wearing gloves whenever you touch anything related with acrylamide. Okay, so we've added, we had water in here, and we've added our solution A, which is our acrylamide, and now we're gonna add solution B. We're gonna add 5.25 mils of solution B. So solution A was the acrylamide, solution B is our tris buffer, which is going to keep it at pH 8, 8.8, .8, a very high pH for the, uh, for the resolving gel layer that we are currently pouring. Um, then you want to put together your plates in the assembly rack. To do this, you're going to have two plates together. You're going to have a larger plate with spacers on the side, and you're going to have a shorter plate and you're going to put the comb into, in between the plates, and you're gonna make a little mark with a pen just where the bottom of the comb is. When you, and then you can take the comb out. This is approximately where you wanna pour your acrylamide to, just a little bit below the level of what's on the mark. So then, to get the plates into a proper position, you want to put it into the clamp assembly, and the clamp assembly has feet on the bottom. It has these little gates that close right there. So you're going to slide your two plates together, shorter plate towards you into the gate. If you were just to open your clamps and, and clamp your gel like this after it's been on the, uh, on the bench top cover like this, and you are using a bench top cover because if you spill acrylamide, you don't want any of it getting onto the bench. Um, because you need these to be completely even for when they're pressing on these right here, you have to move your bench cover forward a little bit, unlock it, and make sure the plates are down at the very bottom. And only then can you clamp, lock it open, and then you can take these plates and they get stuck right in here, just like that. So this is a clamp pushing down on the plate, and then that's pushing it down on this little gray gasket right there, so it's in the proper position, the shorter of the two plates towards you. Okay, so now we have everything set up here. We have our acrylamide solution with the solution A, the solution B, and the water in it. We have our plate all set up here. Now we're gonna add 210 microliters of SDS, 10%. So you should have a solution of 10%, 210 microliters of that. And we're gonna add 100 microliters of APS, ammonium persulfate, that will be already made for you. Hundred microliters of APS. And then we're going to add 10 microliters of Temid theoretically, except we're gonna add some extra Temid here. So this is gonna be a change in protocol. Instead of 10 microliters of Temid, we're gonna add 20 microliters of Temid to make it polymerize a little faster. It will polymerize eventually, even with 10 microliters of Temid, but it's just a long, long time for it to polymerize. So having added a little bit extra 
temid means it polymerizes in 15 minutes, for example, instead of, uh, instead of 30 minutes. So we're going to add our temid. Once we add the temid, it will start the polymerization process. The acrylamide and the bisacrylamide that's in solution A will start cross-linking. So you need to have everything ready to go that you need to, to add the solution into there. So we're just going to swirl. After we swirl, we're going to get a pipette. We're going to get a couple mils, and we're going to start adding solution in, in between the two plates. Just pouring it in between the two plates. Trying to avoid bubbles, if at all possible although we do have a way to take care of bubbles. Okay, so now I've got the acrylamide solution just below that little black mark that I made. And I have a couple bubbles there and I'll show you what to do in a moment. I've also got my pipette full of solution. And that's important because oxygen inhibits polymerization of the acrylamide. So as the oxygen is exposed to the acrylamide, you will have a layer here that will never ever solidify. And so you'll want to know when is it solid in here? Well, if you can know it's solid here, then you know it's solid there. But if oxygen inhibits polymerization, how are you going to know if this is solid? Well, you're going to have acrylamide solution in here with less exposure to oxygen. So when it's polymerized in here, then it's polymerized in there. But remember, oxygen inhibits polymerization. So by the same token, you want a nice straight line on the top here, and you want to get rid of any bubbles. So what you do is you can put just a couple drops of t amyl alcohol on top of your gel. Now, t amyl alcohol must be saturated with water. It's hydroscopic, and it'll suck up the aqueous solution if, if you don't have it saturated with water, which means there's two layers in there. So you need to know which one is the correct layer to add. So adding a couple drops of t amyl alcohol just to the very top of the gel. We're not adding a whole bunch, just a tiny, tiny little bit. Now you're going to see two layers in there. This is going to do two things. It's going to protect our acrylamide layer from oxygen so that it's polymerizing. The interface between the two liquid layers now means that your acrylamide is going to be polymerizing with a perfectly straight line rather than being potentially wavy if, if part of it had maybe a little more oxygen exposure than the other part. and uh, and it also, because it's organic on top, if you have any bubbles on top, it will pop all those bubbles. So basically, just a couple drops of t amyl alcohol, and you wanna make sure you're ready to go when you are pouring this in. The worst thing in the world you can do is have your acrylamide solution all ready, you add the APS, you add the Temid, you swirl, you go around, you talk to your friends for a while, and you go, oh, I guess I better set up my plates. And oh, I guess I better, you know, uh, do, my, do my comb in there and mark it off. Meanwhile, this is starting to polymerize. So you need to make sure you have everything set up around you to do this before the point at which you need to do it. So now it's just a waiting game. We're going to come back in about 15 minutes, and we're going to see if it is polymerized. You also need to make sure that you have your t amyl alcohol ready to go because all the time I have students who, who forget their t amyl alcohol and they're, they're going around, they're looking for a pipette, they're who's got the t amyl alcohol and it's all polymerized and, and basically not very linear on top of their gel by the time they find everything they need. So now we have our polymerized gel. We can pour off the t amyl alcohol from the top and we have our gel material right in here you want to rinse off the top of the gel to get rid of any t amyl alcohol so just a little bit of water in here pouring onto the bench cover always working with a bench cover 
uh, because you don't want to get acrylamide or anything else on the bench and it just makes it a lot easier if you can just pour things right out. So a couple rinses with water. Then you want to get all the excess water out. To do this, just take a piece of paper towel in between the two glass plates to sort of get any extra water out. Just remember, you don't want to touch the gel with the paper towel. So you can get it close to the gel, but don't actually touch the gel. Touch, you don't want to actually want to touch the gel with the paper towel. Just get sort of close um, because gel versus paper towel, gel's going to lose. You're either going to stick pieces of paper towel onto your gel or the paper towel is going to pull away part of your gel. Either way, you don't want that. So then you're going to put this back in the holder. Here I have my solution that I've already made that contains 1.3 mils of solution A, 2.5 mils of solution C, and six mils of water. And now I'm gonna add 100 microliters of my SDS, my 10% SDS. I'm adding 100 microliters of APS. And then I'm adding 10 microliters of Temid. Now remember last time I said that uh, you did not need, that you ne needed to only add 20 microliters of Temid instead of 10. Um, but that's because we had a larger volume last time. So this time you do actually want to add 10 microliters of Temid. If you do 20 this time, it will polymerize too fast before you get a chance to do anything with it. Ten microliters of Temid, and again, having a swirl, a pipette to pipette it up. You're now pipetting it on top of the other gel as much as you can. And remember, you want to do this quickly because it will polymerize. Just like last time, making sure you suck up a bunch in the pipette so that you can see when it is uh, polymerized. When it's polymerized in here, it's polymerized here. Don't forget to put your comb in, the raised side of the comb towards you. A little bit may spill out, that's okay. You're just gonna push it all the way in, just like that. A little bit may spill out, that's fine. That's why we have the bench cover right here. So uh, remember when you are doing the acrylamide, you have two different percentages. You have the lower percentage of acrylamide, that's a 10% acrylamide, and that actually has a higher pH to it. The upper stacking gel has a, it's only gonna be a 4% acrylamide, so it will be very low in the acrylamide concentration. Um, the reason that your, your stacking gel is so low in, in concentration of acrylamide compared to your resolving gel. Your, the purpose of your stacking gel is just to allow everything to stack up into a fine layer. Make sure you watch the video on the theory of what's happening in this SDS page gel so that you can get a better understanding of that. But in the stacking gel, basically, um, your, your proteins are being stacked into a smaller and smaller line till eventually they're a tiny little a straight line when they enter the resolving gel and in the resolving gel again they're able to separate out according to their molecular weight so the uh, the smaller pieces being able to go through the gel faster the larger uh, kd sized proteins taking longer to go through the acrylamide gel you also have the two different ph's and again make sure you understand uh, the purpose of those two pHs. I cover that in the gel theory section. So you're gonna wait again about 15 minutes for this to polymerize. And at the end of it, I will show you what it looks like. After your gel's polymerized, you're going to take it apart and store it until the next lab period. So you're going to press on the clamp to release it. You're gonna release it from the green clamp and then you will just have your two glass plates together with the comb in the middle. Do not take out the comb. If you look carefully, you can see the line here between the two different percentages of acrylamide. To be able to store 
your gel until the next lab period. You're going to add wet paper towel and you're going to wrap it in several layers of wet paper towel. You don't want it to dry out before next class. Then after you have it wet wrapped in multiple layers, this is four paper towels that are soaking wet. Then you're going to put it in some saran wrap. You're going to wrap it in saran wrap. So it's basically pretty much airtight until the next class period. You want to keep it nice and moist until the next class period. So we have unwrapped our gel from yesterday, taken it out of the moist paper towel and saran wrap that, that preserved it, and we're going to set it up to run. So here we have the interior assembly, and there's these little feet on the bottom. So you put the smaller plate towards the inside because there's a large plate and a small plate. You have the small plate towards the inside all the way down on these feet right here. Then on the other side, you need to have something blocking any buffer from leaving the inside. So we just have a piece of plastic that, that blocks uh, and keeps buffer inside. You can run a gel on both sides, or if you only have one gel to run, that's when you use that piece of plastic. So then it's gonna go into the clamp assembly that holds it together. It slides right down inside, all the way down, and then you close the doors on it, just like that. This goes inside of our gel running box right here. Then we pour, electrode buffer in here. We pour it both in between those two glass plates and outside the glass plates. The only constraint is that the level of buffer cannot be above the level of those glass plates. And that's because you want the current to go through the gel. You want the current to go from one electrode to the other and where the wires are, one wire runs down the inside and one wire, one wire is on the outside. So that forces the current to go through the gel, bringing the proteins with it. So if you have the level of buffer higher than the level of the gel, the current will simply go over the gel rather than through the gel. So after we've done this, we're going to slowly and carefully pull up on our comb to take it out. And then we're going to be preparing our samples and heating them up. So we have our S1 and S2 and S3, S4. I've just taken approximately 20 microliters of each one, 20 microliters of the S1, 20 microliters of the S2, et cetera. And I've added an equal volume of our sample buffer. Now our sample buffer contains a high concentration of beta mercaptoethanol and that high concentration of beta mercaptoethanol completely takes apart any disulfide bonds and linearizes our protein. Additionally, there's SDS in there. We want to completely coat our proteins with SDS so that we have that constant charge to mass ratio. If you don't remember the constant charge to mass ratio, please refer to the lecture on aldolase where I talk about the constant charge to mass ratio and how SDS is, is going to help all the proteins become negatively charged so that they will go towards the positive electrode in the gel assembly. So um, we're adding, and of course there's, there's buffer in there. So we've added equal volumes of protein to our 2x SDS sample buffer, meaning the final concentration is 1x of sample buffer inside each one. So now we're going to put them in a 95 degree heat block for three minutes, approximately 95. If it's a couple degrees less, it's not the end of the world. 
So 95 degree heat block for five minutes. If you are working in a group, what can happen is one person can be setting up the gel while somebody else is actually working on the samples. While those are in the 95 degree heat block, we're gonna get ready to load our samples. Particularly the first time you're running one of these gels, it can be difficult to see where the lanes are. It lo just looks completely clear to you. And what I like to do is take a little bit of my 2x sample buffer. Not a lot, just, you know, eight to 10 microliters of the sample buffer. Very, very small amount. And I go through here and I place my pipette on the smaller of the two plates and I just go down all along here, going, depositing a little bit, a little bit, a little bit without regard to where the wells are. And the reason I'm doing that is then it falls into the wells and will outline the wells for you. So if this is your first time that you have ever loaded a gel, doing something like this can help you visualize where the wells are, because otherwise you're looking at a clear gel and clear buffer through clear plates, and it can be very, very difficult to actually see the well. Now, you don't wanna to add too much sample buffer because you don't wanna fill up your wells uh, with sample buffer and no protein. You're just adding a tiny, tiny bit to, uh, to outline the wells and allow you to see them. Okay, so now our samples have been in the, in the heat block for five minutes and we're ready to take our samples out and start loading our lanes. Our S1 and our S2 are much higher concentration than our S3 and our S4, so we need to load less in each of those lanes. We're gonna be loading them in the order S1, S2, S3, S4 marker, and then again, S1, S2, S3, S4 marker in the same gel. And we're doing this because half of our gel we're going to stain with Kumasi Blue to show up all of the proteins. So Kumasi Blue stains every single protein. The other half of the gel, the, the second S1, S2, S3, S4 marker, we're going to be putting into an immunoblot to react it with the antibodies and show you that, you know, you might have had a whole bunch of lanes of protein, but this is the one lane that, that is important. This is where your, uh, this is where your uh, aldolase really was among all those proteins. So to load your sample, you want to get a sample in your pipette. You want to put the pipette above the lane and you want to expel it into the lane. Then when you finish expelling it into the lane, don't let go of the plunger. You're going to bring it up before you let go of the plunger. Otherwise, you're simply going to be sucking up the solution again that you just put in the lane. You can use the same pipette tip twice if you're simply loading S1 in both lanes. You don't have to change pipette tips if you're loading S1 and then the same sample of S1. So here we have S1, S2, S3, S4 marker, and then my next S1 is gonna go right here. Now I'm ready to load S2. S3 has a lower concentration, so I'm going to load more of S3. 
I did five microliters of the first two. I'm doing 10 microliters of S3, and I'll do 20 microliters of S4 because that's the lowest concentration one. And then we're gonna have a marker. And the marker has specific colors in it at certain sizes to allow you to identify which bands belong to what sizes. One of the overall purposes of running things on an SDS gel, besides being able to spot how many proteins you have and follow the level of purification that way, we wanna be able to tell what size is a single subunit of aldolase. Remember that aldolase is a multi-subunit protein, and one of the goals of the experiment is to be able to identify how many subunits are in aldolase. You can look it up, and the data will tell you there are four subunits in aldolase, but how do you figure that out, really? And one of the ways you're going to do that is you're going to, um, one of the ways you're going to do that is you're going to uh, compare the size of a single subunit with the, with the molecular weight that you get off of your sizing column. And the total native molecular weight from the sizing column divided by the size of a single subunit, that will tell you how many subunits there are in aldolase. So the next step is to hook it up to a power supply and uh, and start running the gel. And now you will see bubbles coming up from your gel, and that will tell you that it's actually running. What you will see is the lanes, because remember we loaded different amounts in the lanes, so the volume in the lanes will start to squinch down until they're in uh, a tiny, tiny single band as they move through the stacking gel. That's why it's called the stacking gel. And they move into the resolving layer of the acrylamide, and then they will begin to separate out by size. You will not see the actual uh, protein bands because they have not yet been stained with Kumasi blue, but you will see the size markers because the size markers have already been stained to allow you to witness them separating on the gel. So this is our gel. You can see it has separated out. It has separated out. We can see all the bands, including the two pink bands that are at 25 and 75 kilodaltons. 
the die has run to almost the bottom and now we're going to separate it out using our plate separator to use the plate separator you put it between the two plates holding on to the bottom plate between the two plates fully not just one corner fully and push up and this separates the top plate off the bottom now we have to separate the two halves. Remember we loaded S1, S2, S3, S4 marker, S1, S2, S3, S4 marker. Now we need to separate the two halves of the gel. So we're going to go down with a razor blade and we're not gonna drag the razor blade. We're gonna go chop, chop, chop. If you drag, you're gonna be putting micro fractures into it. So you need to just Chop the two halves apart. To separate them. You also want to separate them from the spacers because sometimes they stick to the spacers. Now, half the gel can go into the Kumasi blue dye and the Kumasi blue dye will stain every single protein that's in there. The other half of the gel is going into our transfer buffer and it needs to soak in the transfer buffer for approximately 40 minutes. What's happening while it's soaking in the transfer buffer, our gel contains SDS and SDS can inhibit the ability of the proteins to transfer to our PVDF membrane. On the other hand, our transfer buffer does not have SDS in it, and it does have uh, methanol in it. Methanol can enhance the ability of the proteins to transfer to the PVDF membrane. So we're soaking it for approximately 40 minutes to allow all the SDS to come out and to allow the, the transfer buffer to go into the gel. In addition to uh, the transfer buffer in the gel, also soaking in here is our PVDF membrane. You need to get it um, hydrated by putting it in methanol briefly first, and then you can take it out of the methanol and put it into soaking in the same transfer buffer. You also need to soak two fiber pads, and you need to soak two, piece, two thick pieces of paper. All of these are gonna be used to make our sandwich. And as soon as our soaking period is over, you will see how we make the sandwich. Meanwhile, um, we're just gonna put the uh, Kumasi Blue on the rocker. We're gonna rock it for approximately an hour to stain, the, uh, to stain all the proteins in here. And after that, we're going to put it in a de-stain solution. The de-stain solution is 40% methanol, 10% acetic acid. The same thing as, as this is, except without the Kamasi Blue. The only difference is this is 40% methanol, 10% acetic acid with Kamasi Blue. Our D-stain has no Kumasi Blue in it. And then that will slowly take the Kumasi Blue out of the gel, except for where the proteins are. Wherever the proteins are, the stain will remain attached to the proteins and uh, this is not an instantaneous process. It comes out slowly and it diffuses into the solution. So you need multiple buffer changes over time. So generally when we are de-staining, we'll do a de-stain for 15 minutes, change the buffer. Another de-stain after an hour, change the buffer. Another de-stain after maybe six hours or overnight. If, you, if, you, if it's late in the day, you can do a, like a 5 p.m. to 8 a.m. de-stain and then maybe a fourth one later. And you wanna do it with a significant amount of buffer. So if you have simply one gel in there that's de-staining, you would use maybe 200 mils of de-stain and keep changing it. But if you have multiple gels, because you can do multiple gels with this procedure at one time. Very often in lab, we're running six or even eight gels at one time. Just like I showed you on the SDS apparatus, you can run one gel or you can run two gels at the same time on the apparatus. Um, by having four apparatus set up, 
you can you can run eight gels at a time and you can have all eight gels sitting in in buffer uh, ready to be soaking in the transfer buffer, ready to be transferred over to PVDF membrane. So you can make yourself very efficient. So if you're doing research in a lab, or if you're if you are in industry, you are very often doing more than just one at a single time. You're doing multiple to 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 have the the maximum usefulness possible because it takes the same amount of time pretty much to do one as it does to do eight or even more. So the more gels you have that are going to be destaining, the more destain you need and or the longer uh, periods of time or the more buffer changes you need. So your goal when doing the destain is to basically have your gel material fairly clear while having your proteins colored dark blue. Now that our gel has been uh, rocking in the Kumasi Blue solution for approximately an hour, it has been stained and we're ready to destain. So you're going to pour off the staining solution because the staining solution is reusable, but you don't want to lose your gel when you do that. So you want to sort of put your finger there and make sure that you're not losing your gel in the bottle when you do. Make sure you use a funnel. Make sure you have gloves on because this will stain your fingers same way it's staining the gel. So now you can see in our corner right here, we have our gel that is completely stained with Kamasi Blue. And we're going to add some de-stain to it. First, we're gonna add just a little bit of de-stain to rinse off the high, concentration of stain that's in the baking dish. We're pouring that off and then we're putting the real de-stain on. A couple hundred mils, does, it's not important to measure at all. We're now going to let it rock in there for approximately 15 minutes and then we will keep changing the de-stain until the gel is clear and we can see our protein bands. This is our S1 lane, and you can see in our S1 lane, we have quite a few proteins. I actually, on this gel, did not load S2, so you can't see S2, but generally in S2, you're going to see that you have fewer proteins than you did in S1, because we've done an ammonium sulfate fractionation so that we only have part of the protein. The middle lane is S3, and you can see we have a very large, big band of S3 because we had a lot of protein. Remember, our absorbance was over three when we got it off the column. So we have a very, very large amount of that. And then that little thin band next to it is our S4. We don't have very much S4 because I only took a small amount of all that, all that six mils of S3. I only took a half mil out of that to put over the S4, and then that was in several fractions, so it's much, much more diluted. So basically, we only have a very small band of S4 right there, but the important thing is we have a very specifically sized band. You can then use the size markers to compare to the known sizes. So you have the two pink bands at 25 kD and 75 kD. And in between, you have the other sizes on the size markers, and you know what size they are because the, uh, the picture of the markers tells you what sizes all of these known bands are going to be. So what you want to do is measure from where they entered the resolving gel not where they entered at the top of the lanes right there in the stacking gel because everything's stacked up together, but where they entered the resolving gel, you can measure each individual lane uh, from where it entered to where it is, divided by the furthest that anything went to the very, very bottom down here. So that, that would be one. So if you were measuring, you know, 
two centimeters and it's not two centimeters but if you were measuring two centimeters divided by two centimeters that's one if you measured one centimeter divided by the two centimeters that the farthest anything went that would have an rf it would have an rf of 0.5 and so you can compare these known sizes to the size of your uh, band here and then you can determine what is the size of of our single subunit of aldolase so remember from the uh, from the sizing column, we're getting our native molecular weight of all the subunits. And from our SGS gel, we're getting what is the size of a single subunit so that you can then do the calculation for how many subunits.